This is the Speak for Yourself podcast featuring the best of Colin Cowherd and Jason Whitlock. I'm your host, Jason McIntyre. Big Monday show for you. An amazing four days of college basketball, including LeVar Ball is gone. Colin has a theory that the bad NBA games and better three-point shooting in the league are helping the college basketball ratings. Hall of Famer Chris Carter, who recently went on the John Calipari podcast, tells you it's unfair that Kentucky gets all the criticism because every other school is doing one and dones. Former NBA All-Star Kenyon Martin stops by. You know, he really bashes on the one and done. I got to say, it's not hurting college basketball, Kenyon. Come on, look at the Final Four this year. We've had a great tournament, ratings are up, and I don't think there's a one and done in the Final Four. The Raiders officially get the approval to move to Vegas, and we have a debate about whether that's going to enhance their brand. And finally, LeBron's Twitter rant. Oh my gosh, what was he talking about? Ready for Speak for Yourself? Cowherd and Whitlock, take it away. All right, welcome to the show. Colin thinks the Raiders in Vegas will be a huge hit. And Jason thinks John Calipari needs to ditch the one and done. What? Speak for yourself starts now. That's what the prompter says. Putting words in my mouth. I didn't say that. He needs to tweak it. Just I like bit. tweaking. I'm all. Ditch, I'm a tweaker. No. Ditch, no. <laughs> all right, hello and welcome. We're joined today by Hall of Famer Chris Carter and NBA All-Star Kenyon Martin. Kenyon, I give everybody the same warning. Tell your girl not to watch. Because if she sees me sitting next to you, yeah. she'll never look at you the same. All right. <laughs> Let's start with the NCAA tournament, where the Final Four is set with Blue Blood North Carolina earning its t- record 20th appearance, while the other three teams, Gonzaga, South Carolina, and Oregon, have one Final Four appearance between them. And that was Oregon back in the FDR days. That's Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Colin, are you disappointed that Carolina is the only blue blood in the Final Four. No, because there's good stories. First of all, I'm from the Pacific Northwest, so Gonzaga, Oregon doesn't break my heart. My, oh, Mark okay. Few is my favorite coach in college sports. Uh, secondarily, really? there's good stories. I think South Carolina is an interesting story. I, think, I don't think this is a dominant Carolina team. I think Oregon's playing with the confidence of a blue blood, and I think Gonzaga, we've all been sitting here waiting for about 12 years, the Gonzaga to break through. So I think you've got like a number one seed Gonzaga that's actually kind of a Cinderella. Oregon, to me, is the most confident team. Then you got the coach in the Carolinas, and and then you got blue blood Roy. So I'm okay with it. Listen, you catch me off guard a lot of times, but you really caught me off guard. You're into big names and big brands. I I thought you were... I agree with you. I think this Final Four is fascinating. One, I'm a Frank Martin homer. Uh, I've known the guy for years, really respect him as a coach. I lived in Rock Hill, South Carolina, understand South Carolina, the culture. Uh, I'm fascinated by South Carolina. I'm fascinated by their defense. I'm, I, I, the way they shut down teams, I think they're going to shut down this Oregon team. They play defense in a really fascinating and interesting way. I love this Final Four. Years ago, Michael Jordan met Utah Jazz in the finals. And I can remember the media projecting that nobody would watch small market Utah. And it got the highest ratings because it was Malone, Stockton, the little underdog. Michael got sick. So sometimes the stories that we don't think are that interesting, the country does. Yeah, small markets don't mean teams can't play. I'm saying we know that now. But I think it's a good story for NCAA basketball right now to have three teams that nobody really expected to be there. Right. And, but Carolina is there to so give the the name of of somebody who people know. No, but I'm uh, I'm excited for this Final Four. So I'm excited. Well, first of all, it's a reflection of what happened during the regular season. This year, the Blue Bloods didn't dominate the regular season. Yeah. Even though they had good teams, teams like Duke struggled, UCLA were they really a national championship team. Kentucky... Kentucky, they were really, really young. Would they be strong enough to put it together at the end with no inside game? So, no, it's not a blue blood, but Gonzaga for the last 18 years has been right there. They've been a number one seed. So, if you talk about a team that was a favorite, not only at the beginning of the season, but throughout the season, Gonzaga was there. Them in North Carolina would be mentioned, and they're number one seed. So, you always have Cinderella, so we can take that as being South Carolina and Oregon could have been a number one seed. If they don't lose their best player, all right, and they and they if they win the Pac-12 tournament, they're going to be a number one seed. So it, you got really three strong teams in one Cinderella coached by Frank, which is a great story. This may be the new normal 
for college basketball in terms of... I think it's harder and harder. We'll get into this when we talk about Kentucky, but I think it's harder and harder for the Blue Buds to hold off the Gonzagas or a South Carolina team that's got really experienced players, not the one-and-done guys. And so, again, and I think I said with South Carolina's defense against Gonzaga's offense, I think it's going to be a fascinating matchup. The ratings are up about 35%. Now, think about this. Blue Bloods didn't make the tournament. Syracuse didn't make it. UConn didn't make it. Indiana Indiana didn't make it. Popular teams like Ohio State didn't make it. And Duke got bounced early. Louisville got bounced early. Michigan State got bounced early. Why are the ratings up 35%? My theory on this is, as the NBA players get so proficient at the three-pointer, NBA games are lopsided. Eight of ten yesterday were blowouts. Would have been nine, but the Clippers blew an 18-point lead. These college games, inartistic, they're close. College kids aren't great perimeter shooters. I turned on these games yesterday. They're all close. Also, college has the advantage. You don't have to follow it that close during the season. You can pick up during yes, the tournament yeah. and still be very excited. I agree. That, that, that's a great point, Chris. The other thing and I think we touched on this last week is college basketball has really been about the only sport that's completely removed from the political discussion that's been going on. And so when people can actually just tune in and enjoy the sport, maybe that's part of the attraction. There's no political discomfort involved with college basketball. It's really just about the game. And the NBA ratings this year are down about 15. College is up 35. Now, now that's a 50-point swing. Why? I'll just theorize here. Star, little politics in the NBA, stars sitting out, college kids all in, the optics to a regular person are, those guys really care, those guys make millions don't. College basketball feels right now, it's more fun. It's more joyful. How much better would college basketball be if these guys stay Stay one more year? Stay one more year. Just think about that. To John Calipari, whose Kentucky team fell short of the Final Four second straight year losing a tremendous game to UNC last night. Now, once again, Calipari built his team primarily on one-and-done talent. Here's one of them, De'Aaron Fox, after the loss. This isn't the locker room that looked like, hey, guys, don't care. I love my brothers, man. The shot just playing back and forth in my head is... It's going to be difficult to get over, but I know I got to. All right, Jace, the emotional moment after missing another Final Four. Should Calipari rethink the one-and-done thing? I'm a, yes, a, a little bit. He's got to tweak it. And, and look, the video, to some degree, makes me giggle. To the other degree, it makes me say, man, these kids really care. And there's a knock on the one and done and Kyle's program as if everybody's just thinking about running off to the NBA. And actually, he's built something where there is a bond built, there is an experience that's unique to Kentucky, and these kids feel a really close emotional bond. But, But Calipari complained about the officiating in the first half after the game. He is young players picked up two fouls, and he chose to sit them. North Carolina had a veteran player pick up two fouls in his first half, and Roy played him because the guy's experienced and knows how to play with yeah. two fouls. Kyle's depending on babies. He doesn't trust them to play with two fouls, so they have to sit. He needs to add a little bit more of an element of some guys that stick around, some glue gli- some glue guys, because the one and done, it's I don't have a problem with it, but it's only produced one championship. All four teams here in the Final Four have a conference player of the year. That guy's a junior or senior. Listen, we all know Kentucky's got talent, but I I say this all the time. You look at pro sports. You you were a veteran NBA guy. You were in a lot of locker rooms. New England's not winning because they're the biggest, fastest. You know what I mean? Cleveland doesn't have the best roster, and for years San Antonio didn't. Maturity is a big thing in basketball. It really is. And when I look at it, sometimes with Kentucky, I feel like sometimes... They've got five lead singers. Like, like I'd like to have... There's nothing wrong with having a two-star backup point that just hustles. Yeah, my thing is, um, isn't he a freshman? Yes. Yeah. I appreciate the, 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 the emotion that he showed, but that sounds like a kid to me that ain't coming back to school there. <laughs> no, no, definitely. No, he's definitely... Yeah, you know what I'm saying? That sounds like, like I got to get over it, like, yeah. quickly. Like, yeah. that's like, I got to make the decision tomorrow. <laughs> like, right. 
I'm glad that he cares. I'm glad, but it hurts the kid at the end of the day, just being one and done. This, you don't like the one and done? To a certain... There's not too many more LeBron James coming through. There's not too many more Kevin Garnett's coming through. Kobe Bryant's. In my opinion. Yep, I agree with I you. I think the NBA game is watered down because of that, the, the one and dones. Kids are there in school for 35 games. And you move them on, they're not learning how to play defense. They're not learning how to pass the ball, probably. There's a whole lot of deficiencies in their game that they're not getting because once the game starts in college, you're not teaching them. And then you're out recruiting, so now you got to worry about the next class coming in. So these guys are done. They're not learning how to play. So then you send this watered-down talent to the NBA, and NBA coaches don't have the time to teach you how to close out. Time, they don't. You know I'm saying? They don't have the time to do it. So therefore, the NBA game is watered-down. So... In a way, it's tough because you, if you turn 18, you have the right to go out and earn a living. I get that. But there's not too many professions, and the NBA is it's, it's a profession. Yeah. Not too many professions that you're ready to go be a part of at 18 years old. <laughs> and this, should be, this shouldn't be an exception. Right, right. but these exactly. are the rules. Yes. And I believe that the kids should have all options. Yeah. You got the option to stay five years, four years, three years, two years, yeah. or if you're good enough to be able to take advantage of the one and done rule, you should. And they should have a viable option in a big school like Kentucky to go to where they have all the benefits of going to the other programs. My problem is we never talk about the other schools. UCLA got a couple one and dones. We don't mention them. North Carolina, got they go one and done. And no one ever mentions Duke. And Duke is doing one and done every year now. So why don't we take some of that criticism of Coach Cal and place it to the other schools, too, because Kentucky is not the only school that's doing it. And just... Coach Cal is very successful at developing the players. Look at the collection of players in the NBA. I'm a defender of Coach Cal. I'm right there with you. But again, if he wants to win more championships, can he not tweak he it a little bit? He more kids' lives. Well, he's doing that by giving them a Division I scholarship and you going to school for free. We get that. But preparing them for life, if it don't work out after one and done. They need more, more substance to them uh, could, could, other than that. Couldn't I argue, too, is that uh, Coach Cal, you're right, other schools do it, but because of his salesmanship, they've become kind of the gold standard of it. Yeah. Like, his branding is so strong that kids know it, announcers talk about it, so when we think one and done, we only think of one program. Now, right. the benefit is... So where has he failed them? He's getting them to the NBA. He, he's teaching them in this small period of time their skills actually get better. It's not like he's getting great talent and not doing anything with the talent, and he's changing the lives of all these kids. So where is he failing the kids? I don't think he's failing them. I'm just asking the question, if, if he wants to win more championships, could he add a, more, a, a different element, a three-star kid, a Luke May, someone to help the one-and-done kids at crunch time so they can win more championships. I'm right there I mean, with they you, they lose to the number yeah. one team by one shot. I don't think he fell in them. <laughs> I, I just look at it at, like... Cal got an extension just now. Yes. For, to the year 23-24. Who is thinking that far ahead in college basketball besides them? Because they know one-and-done. Like, that's what they're looking at. That's what they're... That's all they're looking at is that. And, and for me, it, it's, it should be about developing those kids to be the I, best basketball player that they could possibly be. I, I don't know, and I've asked John this, mm -hmm. I don't know how he keeps doing it. Yeah. To me, it would be exhausting. I don't think people realize how hard it is to build chemistry. Like, if I was a coach, oh, yeah. I wouldn't want to be Calipari. I, I would rather be Mark Few. I would rather get kids that are three-star, build a family and relationship, and I know I only got to recruit one guy a year, not five. I think what Coach Cal is doing is remarkable, I think it's exhausting, yeah. and I don't know how... But we know the reason why you want to do that. Because yeah. you like to be the only star. <laughs> Yo, that's why you have a hard time doing a show But without. right now, hey... Wait, that's what hey, we found out. In the we state know. of University of Kentucky, no. They not, hey... <laughs> he don't have to sell the kids too much. It's UK. Right. The no, proof I get is there. That. If you're top, if you're a five-star and you want to mm -hmm. be a pro, go to Kentucky. That's what kids are thinking. So he doesn't have to sell University of Kentucky to kids. Some guys like to perpetually date. Some guys like to be married. Kyle likes to date. You know, married guys live longer. <laughs> Just gonna tell Single you that. Single guys are happy. Welcome back. Chris Carter's here, now joined by Super Bowl champ Eric Davis. Let's move to the National Football League, where the owners officially approved the Raiders' move from Oakland to Vegas today. The vote was 31 to 1. Pretty, pretty big there, though. They intend to play in Oakland for the next couple of years. Here's owner Mark Davis on the move. I love Oakland. I love the fans in Oakland. 
and I know that there's going to be disappointment and maybe some anger. And I just hope that in the future as we play in Oakland this year that they understand that it wasn't the players, it wasn't the coaches that made this decision, but it was me that made it. And if they have anybody to talk to about it, it should be me. And I will, in the coming days, try to explain to them what went into making this difficult decision. All right, we'd like the idea of an NFL team in Vegas long been inconceivable due to concerns about gambling. Uh, are we making a mistake here? No, I don't think there's any mistake here. Uh, listen, this has been inevitable in my view that some f major sports franchise was going to go to Las Vegas. Las Vegas is the hub of American sports. It is ground zero for most American sports fans if they can afford to make the trip. Uh, the, the Raiders brand is so strong that this move, it, it isn't the Baltimore Colts moving out of Baltimore to Indianapolis in the middle of the night. It's not the Browns moving to Baltimore. It's not our model. The Raiders brand is so strong, the L.A. fans that flew to Oakland will now be very happy to fly to Los Angeles, I mean, to Las Vegas to watch them. The Oakland fans will love to fly to Las Vegas to watch them play. I, I think this is actually a good thing for the Raiders and the NFL. I think this is going to enhance the Raiders brand. I think they can max out that brand in Las Vegas probably better than any other, uh, any city in California. Well, Vegas is transient, but on the eight home game model, unlike baseball where you have to fill a stadium 81 times, I think on the eight home game model it works. And also, you know, the NFL, they're putting games in Mexico City and London, and they did in Toronto. So they clearly want to globalize the brand, right? There's not that many American cities that are global. New York is, L.A. is, San Francisco is, and Vegas is. And I think the owners are sitting there thinking nothing against St. Louis, San Diego, Green Bay, but Vegas is a global brand, and that's where the market's headed. And if you look at it from a time standpoint, Vegas, where are they hurting as far as hours where they don't have much entertainment? It's that, during the day right? and on the weekend. And if they have the Wet Republic? Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> and if they do happen to have primetime games, that even elevates it because it's a primetime city. So I'm not surprised, based on the NFL owners. And when you look at the Raiders in five years, if you look at the overall evaluation, how much this team is going to be worth now, because the name of the game in the National Football League, we know, is stadiums and revenue generated at those stadiums. And if you're not willing to concede in that local market, which Oakland, that city, wasn't able to do, then these teams can move on. Like, I'm not surprised. I would have loved to see Oakland stay there, but the business model just doesn't work. Right. The city can't commit to the team from a facility standpoint. And this is not new news, okay? When I played against Oakland, the stadium was obsolete. The practice facilities are obsolete. So, I mean, this has long been overdue, Eve. Yeah, the stadium, the stadium's a dump. We all know that. So there, there's no question. But they made a mistake. Because I, Mark Davis, I, I sat across from Mark Davis not, not too long ago talking about this team, talking about wanting to go or stay. And he wants to stay in Oakland. He wanted to stay in Oakland. But Oakland, what, what they did, they, they, tried to, they tried to sun him. They tried to come in, and you know he was Al Davis's son that had been that had a certain stigma, and they viewed him a certain way. And Oakland gave him the take it or leave it. And the problem is that it's an NFL franchise, and you can leave it and find someone find a home somewhere else. But he didn't want to leave. They waited too late to come with the real deal to start trying to figure something out. That's why they they are making a mistake because if if you tell Mark just go back and try to renegotiate this and get this worked out with the city. They will put a new facility there. You have a fan base that is there. Um, I, I get what you're talking about going to Vegas and Vegas being that transient city, that worldly city, uh, but you got SFO Airport right there. <laughs> and, and people can get to, to that Raiders, to that Raider, those Raiders games, and you have the brand that's already big. It's already a global brand. You, you, you don't have to leave Oakland and, and leave that city. I think, you know, let's say, it's not a coincidence what teams have left. San Diego wouldn't build a new stadium. Oakland didn't want to build a new stadium. They want to now. Well, okay. <laughs> and that, and, and L.A., by the way, the citizens won't build it either. They're forcing the billionaire to. Los Angeles' self-esteem is not tied to football. We got beaches and 31 music venues. Californians are taxed at a 13% rate. What's happening in the NFL right now, the NFL's always used its power to force local municipalities to pay for stadiums. Mm -hmm. And California's yep. like, you've seen our beaches? We're not going to pay anymore. 
And so our self-esteem in this state's not tied to football, and the only way we're getting teams is Stan Kroenke says, okay, I'll pay for it. Oakland's like, San Diego's like, we don't need you in our town. Well, Oakland right now is saying we need you, and that's why they were Too asking late. them. They, but that's what I'm saying. They were asking them to hold off the vote because no. they do want to try to find it. And that's what I'm saying. They, they went to him, and they tried to chump Mark early on and not give him the respect of being able to leave and being the owner of that franchise. And now they, they back themselves into a corner. And you're right, it's too late. But I'm saying it didn't have to happen. And I, and I do think they're making a mistake. And it's going to take a while for you to... You're going to lose some of that fan base. You really are. This is not going to be the, the easy move that everyone thinks is going to be. I, I just want to be clear here. Colin is not Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys. He's only lived here in Los Angeles <laughs> for six months. Welcome back, Kenyon Martin here, now joined by a former NBA coach, Lionel Hollins, also part of a Portland Trail Blazer team I loved as a kid. NBA's best from last year, the Cavs. LeBron's squad beaten soundly by the Wizards over the weekend. They've now lost seven of their last 12, dropping them into a tie with Boston for the East's top seed. LeBron opened up about their struggles this year after the loss. Oh, the process is all about winning, but you, we know what goes into that. And uh, like I told you guys the other day, this has been one of the most challenging seasons of my career just because of all the injuries and, and you know, it's been very challenging on our ball club and, um, you know, the, the lineups and different guys in and out. We get one guy come in and then we get another guy out and tonight, you know, we thought we was whole and then Shump is pulled late, you know, so, mm -hmm. so it's been very challenging. You concerned about their chances to repeat? I mean, when Shumpert's out, I mean, what, I mean <laughs> come on. My God, it's Be like, nice to him on Shumpert. Listen, uh, when LeBron says it's one of the most challenging seasons of his career, that's significant if you remember the first year in Miami. That was a challenge that ended in a train wreck against Dallas in the NBA Finals. So, yeah, when he's analogizing it to that and some of the previous struggles, because we've seen... When LeBron's teams have this kind of adversity, it can linger into the playoffs. When LeBron's mentally right and has a belief in his team and teammates, they can conquer anything, a 3-1 deficit. But when his confidence is a little bit tweaked or he feels like the, the adversity is becoming too much, his teams can spin off the rail and get beat in the playoffs. So, yeah, I'm concerned. You know, it's interesting. LeBron wanted scores because he watched Golden State and he thought, we need more shooters. Well, they got him Corver, you know, they got Channing Frye, and they got uh, Darren Williams, and they got him shooters. But shooters generally aren't great defensive players, right? So is it possible that as they were pursuing Golden State to get more outside threats, they became a little more finesse, and they inherited or acquired guys that aren't great defensive players? Well, that's part of the problem. I think what, uh, for me, what LeBron was saying was I need playmakers. I can play 37, 38 minutes a night, but if I'm on the court, somebody else takes the ball and makes plays for everybody else. If I have to do it the whole time, you know, he's a little bit older now and he's been banged up. Yeah. And like you said, though, they've added Corver, they've added Derek Williams, they've added uh, Darren Williams, they've added Fry. None of them have been known to be great defensive players. Right. And LeBron also talked about toughness. That team last year was tough mentally and physically, and they yeah. got after you and they stayed after you. And I don't think this team has acquired that mentality. I think it's still possible, but I think that it's a commitment that the players have to have themselves. Defense is hard. You know it. You were a great defensive player. Defense is not hard. Defense is about effort. Defense is about being taught how to play defense early on. Defense is about will. And defense is about being on the same string as your teammates and paying attention to film and all of that. You can be a somewhat mediocre defender and be a great team defender, which they don't have a whole lot of that right now. You know, you look at, I was hearing last year, I love JR to death, played on the team with JR in Denver. But me hearing Ty Lue saying that JR was their best perimeter defender, Rose, I was like, wow. <laughs> like, how bad are the rest of the guys? <laughs> you know, I, mean, I love, listen, I love JR to death, but I was there, I've seen it firsthand. You know, and just watching them now, you can tell, like, Kyrie is not the best defender. No. Kyle Korver is not the best defender. Shump gives an honest effort, but he, he's not out there like the rest of those guys. The minutes are not there for him to be out there like the rest of those guys. But like I said, defense is, in my opinion, defense is one of the most intimidating things in sports when you do it. Yeah. And as of late, they haven't been doing it. And it's hard to turn that back on. Is it, is it possible because of what we've seen over the last three years, which is this sort of referendum that you have to shoot threes to have any value, 
Is it possible the NBA now has shifted and it's not about rebounding and owning the glass. It's about possessions and hitting threes. And Cleveland's built for the new NBA. Yeah, but they're struggling. They, I don't think they still haven't won two games in a row since February. The, and again, they may have turned into a team that doesn't work unless you're playing the Golden State Warriors who plays exactly like you. They're a team, like you said at the start, that's built to chase Golden State, yeah. but maybe has a problem against the rest of the league that brings some of these intangible things that Kenyon's talking about. Do you, do you about. think anybody in the East matches up with them? Well, I think uh, the Wizards in Boston both match up. could match up. You have to have somebody that can contain and, and at least defend LeBron. And I think what happens is, is like you said, they went out there and trying to match up with Golden State, but there's a lot of other teams that they have to get through before Golden State. Yeah. And they have to really bear down. I think Bogut getting hurt was huge because he could at least guard the basket. They have no rim protection right now. Is, is it possible also, Kenyon, that when they did win in Cleveland, I mean, it really was a great story, right? Going home, the letter, and winning. They still have a hangover. Like, they, they got famous, they got rich. They're fat and happy. Is part of this just Cleveland? They exhale. They just ha they haven't done it yet. You know, they're exhale. just not ready. Yeah, I just think as long as LeBron is there, I don't think he will let them do ex exhale, so to speak. But the rest of the league is like, yo, we here. Especially the East. They're like, we're not just going to continuously let you run through this conference. Like, we're going to show some restraint, some, some, some care about ourselves. That LeBron, okay, we know you're great, but... We put these shorts on these shoes just like you. And it's competition out here. And we're going to compete. And that's what they're showing it. I think, again, I think it's a real possibility the Cavaliers don't make the finals. I believe the Wizards. I believe the Celtics. I even think Toronto. Again, when, when there's adversity, LeBron that mentally can get off and it can affect the rest of the, the team, I think the Cavaliers are in some real jeopardy. To Colin Kaepernick who may not be able to find a job, but has found no shortage of people willing to defend him. Now Richard Sherman is speaking out on Kaepernick's behalf, saying the former 49ers quarterback is being blackballed over his political protest and, quote, would be a starter on probably 20 of the teams in the NFL. Colin, do you agree Cap is being blackballed? Yes, and I think lots of people are all the time. I think there's not a press release. We, we're in Hollywood. You offend the wrong group, and you won't get offers for movies because there's a million movie stars and a million directors. Um, I believe there is a, there, I would say it's growing dissent, but I think there's a lot of people in the league that just don't like Kaepernick because it was a shot at whoever it was a shot at, maybe military, maybe law enforcement. And I think there are grudge holders in the NFL. But I think this happens all the time. You know, somebody in our business, Keith Oberman, super talented. We just had the most frenzied political environment of our lives. How come he couldn't get a job? He carried a network. Why? After years and years and years and years and years of maybe rubbing people the wrong way, network said, no thanks. There was no memo posted, but the word was out. He can be difficult. This is what happens Hollywood, Main Street, Wall Street. You tick off the wrong people and you find out very quickly you're unemployed. You've, you've made an excellent point. I'm going to bring it all the way back to just football. And I, people get irritated when I say this because, look, I, I love the dude. He's, we grew up together. I love him. Jeff George was super talented. And at 32-33, the NFL was like... Yep, that's a great example. Super talented. More, far more talented than Colin Kaepernick. Absolutely. And the NFL got tired of him. But they, they waited. They didn't do that when he was in his 20s. They were tired of him then. Let me tell you this. At, <laughs> I'm going to tell you this right now. At 49, he's better than Colin Kaepernick. <laughs> no, he's he not. Yes, Stop he is. It. He no, throws a better ball than Colin. Colin Kaepernick's not any good, and he's not as a backup quarterback. People it thought Jeff George was Elway-esque with a bad two. Mark Sanchez is good? It has nothing no, to do with... Wait, wait, hold on. No, no, have wait, wait, if you're the, talking about... the baggage or the distraction. If you're talking about talent, so is he being blackballed? Yes. Yes. You know, the issue with the league is that anyone, and I should tell young players this, at any moment, they can run you out of here. All you can do is put, autograph your performance on film so that someone else wants you. Because if your play doesn't say, we want you around, you make it easy for them. So you're right. At any time, any player, they can say, we don't want him in our league. But it has nothing to do with play. And that's why I throw Mark Sanchez out there. 
You look at what Mark is what Mark has done. Mark played. That Mark, quarterback room is for guys that are all in. Kaepernick well, doesn't even up. really care I talk, about and football. This is, this is the thing. I talked to guys that after the first minicamp that played on that team last year with Mark Sanchez, and they were like, "There's no way he can play." They knew it then. That's why he's gone. Dallas. Dallas is trying to figure out. They have a quarterback. Tony Romo is probably going to be gone. They don't have a quarterback. They let him go. He can't play, but he gets picked up like that. So if you if you really truly don't think it's about something other than play, that's oh, no, crazy. No, I think it's about. But he's he doesn't care about football. That's why he's a vegan. That's why he weighs a buck ninety now. There are if other guys. Really, wait, wait. If he cared about look, Aaron man. Foster cares about football. No one said he didn't care when he decided to to be a vegan. Yeah, well, but what, what is that? Too what, when but, he got off the beef. What is that? <laughs> well, I, I did tell him he needed a cheeseburger, yeah. but yes. what does that have to do it with him caring about do, football? And look, and I hate to go all the way back to my little mediocre football career, but again, coaches used to look at me and be like, "Man, the way this dude eats, he don't care about football," and so we ain't all in on him. Same thing with Kaepernick. Well, the thing, let's go back to the beginning of Cap's career. And, E, you've covered the team, you've covered the game, and you know that there are people that question his overall attitude, his football IQ. Could he be a, a, a pocket passer? What type of system and what type of leader that he was? So there was all those questions before. So for me, yeah, you could be like, yes, are they blackballing? Yes, they are blackballing. But also, he hadn't been good enough where he couldn't get blackballed. That's the biggest problem now. Where he didn't play well enough, he was not a winner. Early in his career, he won a lot of games. Now, the surrounding talent, not only offensively, defense oh, and geez. special teams, was totally different. But people don't look at Cap as a starting quarterback, and Agreed. that's one of the biggest dilemmas besides him um, in the protest last year. That's the reason why he's not signing Are there 32 today. backups in the league better than him? No, I don't think so, no. So there you go. No, no, no. But again, but again, <laughs> once you're one. once you're not a future investment, my mom used to always tell me, because I was a mouthy kid, believe that or not, she used to say, you should be seen and not heard. When you're a backup anything in the league, you can't be 1% headache. Stars can be, stars can have drug, stars can have issues, yep. stars Tolerance can have... Tolerance goes you're way, right. way right. I know uh, that. Hey, by the way, when player reps for years and years, just the player reps, there used to be, and I don't know, you guys can tell me, but... Were you guys ever player reps? Yes. Okay, I was always told, no. be careful about being a player rep, because if the owners sit in a room and you're both wearing suits, you'll be the first guy cut. This league has shown, you tick off an owner, unless you're a star, you're done. I'm a last point on just the football. And yeah, he can throw the football, but yeah, there may be 32 quarterbacks, he's as good as them. But it's a leadership position, and if they don't believe you can lead, and that's what got Jeff George into trouble, Great talent, but they didn't believe he could lead. Colin Kaepernick don't even know who the hell he is. He's got an identity issue he needs to deal with before he can lead himself, let alone a football team. This is the Speak for Yourself podcast featuring the best of Colin Cowherd and Jason Whitlock. I'm your host, Jason McIntyre. Make sure if you don't catch us on the tube every day, we're on iTunes, SoundCloud, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook. Basically, if you have social media, you can find us. We're out there. Hey, quick word on LeVar Ball. I really do think running his mouth as much as he did last week with the Steph Curry comments and the Michael Jordan, that he put a gigantic target on the back of his son, Lonzo Ball. Lonzo took the court against Kentucky, and from the jump, those Kentucky guards were all over him at both ends. They made it personal. And it's funny, I did my radio show on this Saturday. Charles Barkley said the same thing over the weekend. The way he saw it, that it was personal. Kentucky wanted blood from Lonzo Ball. They got it. Oh, you're the best player in college basketball? You're better than Curry, Westbrook, and LeBron? Oh, we'll show your dad who's the boss. LeVar, keep it shut. You don't need to run your mouth like that. You got a great kid who's going to be a top five pick and a great pro. We'll see you tomorrow.